Hello, welcome to Emotional Badass, where Moxie meets Mindful. I'm Nikki Eisenhower, your host, life coach, and psychotherapist. And on today's episode, I'm discussing how to move from survival to thriving, a strategy for anxiety and PTSD recovery. I really wanted to do a specific episode on this, even though these are things that I mention throughout multiple episodes, because most of you who are out there listening to this show are working very, very hard to move head knowledge to heart knowledge so that your body can actually feel peaceful and calm. The things that I'm going to talk about today are very, very simple but they're not necessarily easy. And when we've had a life of a lot of things being difficult, a lot of things being full of struggle, it's hard to believe that a very, very simple strategy could be wildly impactful to reduce our negative symptoms. Unless you're nursing a victim mentality, What I know that you want is to speed your recovery and growth work because we all want that. And and that makes so much sense because if we're in pain, if we're in discomfort, if we're in broken heartedness, if we're exhausting ourselves with hypervigilance, what we most want and need is peace, is freedom from these symptoms that keep us in a hypervigilant state. We very healthily do not want to attempt to live life through this survival mode. We really do want to thrive. We also want our hard-earned income to go to homes and vacations and car payments and having fun and moving life forward and retirement. We really don't want to be paying so much money, time, energy to unravel the effects of a dysfunctional childhood or to unravel the effects of some adult dysfunctional relationships, whether those relationships are with other people or with ourselves. We just want to live. We can become angry and bitter and resentful at all that it takes to heal. We go through a lot of grief on the healing journey because a sad reality is that many of us are either the only one in a family system or one of the few in a family system that's willing, that's seeking, that's putting focused energy into betterment, into authenticity, into boundaries, into honesty. And this is at first enraging and then sad and lonely. And this is all part of the healing process. Another sad truth is that many of us have no idea how to thrive. We know we want to, but we don't really know how or what thriving is. I didn't know the first thing about thriving because I absolutely thought that survival mode was just my personality, was just my temperament, was just the way that I was because it was all I had ever experienced. I, like many of you listening, had never tasted thriving in my mind and in my body. Many clients over the years have admitted to me in their individual sessions that they're not sure that they've ever seen someone truly taking care of themselves. They don't know what it looks like. We might not know what a truly healthy relationship is. My favorite episode that I've put out in the last year is actually one with Chris on our Patreon. And we shared a story about our summer vacation. And I just hadn't thought of it, but when it happened, it reinforced what I'm talking about today. Because me and the show, we 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 received more feedback about how helpful it was and really how astonishing it was for listeners to hear Chris and I share and be with each other. So my intended lesson in that episode wasn't really what we intended. 
Many comments sounded something like, wow, is that what a healthy relationship sounds like? Because we just don't get enough examples. Now, many of us have experienced the brief relief of some wins. Maybe it's a moment like we get a job that we really wanted. Maybe it's passing a test in a subject that's a particular struggle for us. Maybe it's successfully changing a destructive relationship with food or drugs or alcohol. Maybe it's a win like setting a boundary and having that boundary respected by another person. Maybe it's starting to plan for retirement or making a big move to a place you felt called to go, like my call to these Rocky Mountains I love so much. These wins may be little sneak peeks, little windows into what thriving mode feels like. Because when we're thriving, it feels like everything is right in the world. Despite all things not being right in the world. And we crave this. We chase this. We desire and hope for more peace more feelings of relief and ease, joy and wins. Now, I am most certainly in a thriving mode now, but many different healers over the course of my life and my development, from my teens through my 20s and even my early 30s, would tell me things like, Nikki, you need to calm your body. You need to take a breath. Nikki, don't try to fix everything all at once. Think and see yourself as good enough. Learn to self-soothe. You just got to learn to self-soothe. But these messages did not penetrate me while I was in survival mode. And I noticed this with many, many, many highly sensitive clients. Now, I heard them the way I know that my clients hear me. Our ears work. We process the words, right? Right. So I heard them, but those words didn't hold any substance for me. There was nothing for me to hold on to. They essentially sounded like throwaway comments in one ear and out the other. They had a real blah, 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 yada, 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 counselor talking, counselor talking, counselor talking kind of quality that made these words seem valueless to me at the time. Now, why? Why would I pay people for their professional opinion and throw this part of their feedback away? Survival mode. I, like many of you, was so stuck in survival mode in trying to just live, trying to get by. At different parts of my life, I was trying to not be homeless. I was trying to not drown in abusive and destructive relationships. I was trying to make sense of being gaslit that these messages of simple healing, of soothing myself, might as well have been in another language. Survival mode in the most basic sense means that a body is in a sort of pre-flight or fight or freeze constantly. Doesn't mean that you're fully panicking in that moment. I really like to think about a slingshot here. Because survival mode feels like pulling the slingshot taut. That rubbery part is tight, ready to launch, tension built up, ready to snap. And that's how we live when we're living through survival mode. And inevitably, we snap, just like that slingshot. Because that tension has got to go somewhere. And this can look different for different temperaments, for different ages, for different seasons of our own lives. But it can look like lashing out at the nearest and dearest person in our lives, the safest person that maybe we think won't really leave us. This can look like being super critical internally, using our self-talk to bully inside of ourselves. This can look like just walking out. This is what flight looks like in action when that slingshot lets go. It's just disappearing from a scene. Sometimes this looks like screaming till the energy leaves the body. For some of us, this might be a destructive moment 
where we might hurt ourselves or objects that are around us. That snapping point is the slingshot letting go and launching. And there's no other choice when we pull that slingshot back. It's a lot harder to let it go without slinging. But in that sling, in that letting go of that tension, then and only then does survival mode let go. But we are not then in thriving mode. How do you feel after you've lost it, after you've snapped? Historically, I've felt a lot like a wet, limp noodle. Like my body, my mind, my heart just couldn't give anything else. Kind of like those slingshot bands after they've shot, they're just loose, hanging rather uselessly. The tension gets all spent and exhausted. This might sound a little scary, but I think it's an important point. And nothing that I put out there is to frighten any of you. It's to help empower you to know what you're dealing with so that you can deal with it and get closer to thriving, letting go of survival as you do. But this can be an addictive process if we don't intentionally learn how to thrive. Because without intentionally learning how to thrive, we wind up yo-yoing between that tension of the slingshot and that loosey, goosey, wet noodle spent feeling and if that's the only relief we can get from that tension we can almost develop an addiction to that process now i don't want to live in this slingshot mode of ebb and flow of exhaustion i don't want to be a slingshot at all and i suspect you don't want to be either And the good news is that we really do not have to be, even if this is the only mode we've ever known, even if it's the only mode we've ever had modeled for us. Now, this technique that I'm about to outline for you, it's not fancy. It's not glamorous. It doesn't have a bewitching, catchy name that a coach or a therapist can market the crap out of. But I found that the remedy for survival mode, and that's really what we're working on is to invite this thriving mode over and over and over and over and over again until the subconscious mind grabs hold and accepts that this is now the new normal for this system, that the new program won't run on survival, that the new program is to thrive. So how do you invite thriving mode? I've broken this down into a three-step process. One is radical acceptance. Radical acceptance sounds like this in our self-talk. Hello, body. I know that you've learned to be hyper aware in an attempt to protect me, but this is not sustainable. And I'm in charge and I'm willing and able and ready to teach you a different way of being. Radical acceptance does not mean that we agree or we like what's happening internally or externally around us. Radical acceptance is an ownership of what is instead of being angry that what we want isn't available right this second. This is important because we've got to stop being mad and frustrated and annoyed with ourselves Because these feelings keep us in survival mode. It keeps the nervous system and our emotional system irritated or inflamed or activated. And this is what extends our recovery. Now, I did this to myself for many, many years, maybe a solid decade. Radical acceptance is the permission to let go of the fight And to let go of the flight and the freeze. We can't do that unless and until we radically accept exactly where we are, exactly what our symptoms are, and that we cannot just snap our fingers or make a decision that we are going to change how we feel, that it is an actual process. So radical acceptance helps us accept the process instead of fight the process and fight ourselves. 
You can't get to thriving mode if you're fighting yourself all the way to get there. So the first step is just radical acceptance. Now, in real life, when I know that the thing I need to do is radically accept something that I cannot stand, that I'm pissed off that I have to deal with, I sit with myself and I go to radical acceptance. How do you go to radical acceptance? Step two, stop and slow and breathe. This is the part that just doesn't sound hard enough. It doesn't sound complicated enough to actually offer us freedom, huh? But what if it is this simple? External life is always going to give us more and more and more and more. That's been a major lesson in my life, that this sneaky expectation that can grow inside of me That there will be this part of life that just gets easy with no obstacle. Is my inner child creating an ideal? Radical acceptance helps me radically accept that life sends waves. And to put my energy into holding out that the ocean will stop sending waves is a waste of my energy. I'd rather learn to swim. I'd rather learn to surf. I'd rather learn to drive a boat. There are many options in this healing path. It does not have to be a one-size-fits-all. And you will find your way as you go. You will make it your own. Our wellness does not hinge on the external world the way that we think it does. Rather, it hinges on the management of our internal world. And from management of our internal world, we grow peace and confidence. And from that internal place of greater strength comes more external empowerment to change what we need to in our external world and what we can. We learn to lean in and put our energy into the things that we actually can affect and can control while letting go of the rest. This step two is to stop and slow and breathe. It doesn't mean you have to stop 100% of the things that you're doing. Maybe you're listening to me right now while you're in a car going to work. Maybe you're listening to me right now while you're making lunch for your kids to go to school. Maybe you're taking a bath. Maybe you're doing laundry. Maybe you're working out. Whatever you're doing, I invite you right now in this moment to take a deep, slowing down breath. Now, if you just thought it without doing it, It really makes me want to ask you, is this because you're in survival mode? Is there a part of you that dismisses this? Like, I don't need to do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard her. I thought, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Breathe. What if I challenge you right now in this moment to push through that and to say, hey, self, I get to practice these easy, simple things. Stop overthinking it. Stop overcomplicating it. Just do it. Take this breath. Because the hypervigilance creates overthinking. To be able to just think and do, we must intentionally practice that. That's what I'm inviting you to right now in this moment. So breathe. Take a breath with me. One, two, three. Breathe. Now, survivors tend to feel behind everyone. Slow down. Because it seems like others launch themselves forward into adulthood with more ease and more support. It seems that others have less obstacles. It seems as a highly sensitive person that others have less emotionality to process. Therefore, they can get farther faster. And we covet that. And we tend to use that observation, right, wrong, or otherwise, to self-flog to give ourselves a whole lot of crap about why we're not anywhere other than where we are right now, which is a form of telling ourselves where I am now and the progress I've already made is not good enough, that I should be three or five or 10 or 20 years ahead of where I am right now. It's unfair to do that to ourselves. It's actually cruel. The constant trying to get ahead is the opposite of a presence practice. Overthinking is not normal and it's not sustainable if you want a good, solid life. 
those of you with chronic headaches, this might be why. Especially if those headaches feel like they come from a tension behind the eyes and over the scalp. Because overthinking is like making your brain chew and chew and chew and chew when maybe for the sake of me explaining how something feels, I I can say that a brain is not meant to chew. What if our brains are just meant to kind of drink smoothies and sip iced tea? The radical acceptance is needed as a permission to slow down to end the fight with our own circumstance. Part of slowing down can be bringing in the spiritual belief, and you don't have to believe and buy into it to practice it. The belief can come later. But we can practice the spiritual belief that we are right where we are supposed to be because there are lessons to learn for us here. And trying to outrun these lessons doesn't let us learn them. And that's what makes us feel like we're not going forward as quickly as we want. When we stubbornly refuse to look around and deal with the presence that we're in. So we can slow down. Take a breath with me right now and see if you can slow down your internal thoughts. If daily meditation feels very far away... Just start right now here with me easily, simply, because this is maybe the best way for me to teach this concept, because you are in the present moment right now with yourself. You're listening to me talk over this microphone. This is your present moment. Notice your mind. Take a breath and invite it to slow down. Do you notice more of an ability to slow down? the more I invite you to it. Depending on how well you've already tackled some of these dynamics, this will be easier or harder. Allow whatever is happening to just be what it is. No judgment. No shooting on yourself about where you should be or what you should have known and figured out already. Breathe and let all that go. There's no room for judgment in radical acceptance. Giving yourself permission to stop, slow down, and breathe is a permission to not take on the weight of the world. And this is often what we missed growing up in a dysfunctional family. We missed a healthy adult walking in and saying, Oh, honey, that's for grown-ups to figure out. You don't have to think about that. I hear the neighbor's kids outside playing. Why don't you go outside and play? It's okay to play instead of stressing. That's my job as the grown-up. Yours is to go play. And then trust that I'm going to handle all the things. Take another breath and notice your body right now. In radical acceptance, we radically accept that we are reparenting this inner child who learned to pick up way too much stress, way too much responsibility. And with few to no people to explain, with few or no people to connect with us in an emotionally intelligent way to teach us tools and strategies so we can cope with this crazy thing that is life every single day, of course we learn to overthink. Of course we learn to overstress. Of course we learned perfectionism to try to feel good by being perfect. All those things make sense. But what makes sense now is owning that we can be different with ourselves now. Notice in your body where there is tension right now. Take a breath and soften the neck. Soften the jaw. Ease tension behind the eyes. Let go in the belly. Soft belly. Round Buddha belly. Breathe. Notice how your rib cage expands and contracts. Isn't that interesting? That all those little muscles between every single rib move with every single breath. Isn't your body amazing? Notice how your heart continues to beat no matter what. We can't find gratitude or self-compassion if we're internally hypervigilant trying to go a million miles an hour. By stopping and slowing and breathing, we create the space 
to learn the lessons that are waiting for us to learn so that we can thrive. Step three is to repeat. That's it. Just repeat one and two. Holding space for ourselves is understanding with radical acceptance that all the things that we struggle with right now were reinforced thousands and thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of times by every day during our development, maybe every day of our lives, especially if we have had an internal critic. We use our mindfulness muscles to see these things about ourselves. So we go back to one and two, back to radical acceptance of whatever we face accepting. And then we stop and we slow internally and we breathe. No matter what we're doing externally, we can be slower and more peaceful as we move through. And if you're programmed strongly for hypervigilance, where you are just watching and watching and scanning and scanning and paying attention and paying attention and looking and looking, let's not fight that. Let's just use that mode to invite this healing process. Instead of scanning for danger, what if we scanned for radical acceptance? What if we scanned for opportunities to slow and breathe? We just might change the energy of every single day of our lives if we do so and create the petri dish of calm, ease, allowing, compassion, encouragement that we all deserve as we grow. The serenity prayer is a massive grounding force to this process. And if the word prayer just doesn't do it for you because some of your abuse comes from religion, change it to poem, change it to a message, change it to a long mantra, whatever you need to call it to use it. Because it's central to healing and it is the simplification that leads us to thriving. God or the universe or the energy of the world, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Way back when, I could not control my body or my racing thoughts, no matter how much I wanted to. But I did learn that I can direct them, I could guide them, I could challenge them, and I could refocus on what serves me instead of allowing that old funky programming to take over and run again. I couldn't control what happened to me in my past, but I can control what I do about it in this present moment. I can control and shape what I think about it now and how I think about it. My past has forced my growth, and I no longer need to resist it. It's done, and it's over. And if it's not done and over yet, I am working to figure out what will end this pain and this struggle. And I am determined to get to thriving. You may be in a place where you can't yet control your body's activation in any way, shape, or form. But consider giving yourself permission to work with this dynamic during normal day-to-day activities. You're not just healing when you turn on emotional badass. You're not just healing when you show up for your therapist or a support group. Every minute, we are either moving ourselves towards healing or towards dysfunction. Calm is the friend that I want to hang out with the most, not hypervigilance. It may be a sick kind of comfort, that hypervigilance of I can notice and remember all things. And you may have needed that for a while. But my challenge to you is, is it time to put it down for the greater good, for the life that you deserve and want to live? The more I integrate thinking versus overthinking, simplifying versus complicating, ease instead of struggle, good enough instead of not good enough, the more we get control over this mind and body. I believe every human being was always meant to respond to this mind and this body that we have 
through compassion, acceptance, self-love, and self-respect. So this simple, yet not easy, method that I laid out for you is one, radical acceptance. Two, stop, slow, breathe. And three, repeat. If you add actual sitting with yourself and meditation to your day, super bonus points, you guys. What if you did this for a week as an experiment? What if you did this for a month? What if you gave yourself permission to practice this, knowing you don't have to do it perfectly, but you gotta do it? I don't know what finally made it click for me that this was the way to thriving, to more personal freedom, but it did. I hope by me sharing today's episode that it it helps something important and simple click for you too. You, the world, everyone can benefit from less struggle What a thing to own on the path to empowerment that I am in charge of bringing myself less struggle and I will do that out of a sense of self-love for me. For those of us that didn't receive that from a family of origin or didn't receive enough of it, this might be one of the most brave things we can do for ourselves. One of the most vulnerable things we can do is to radically accept and radically own that we can bring less struggle to ourselves no matter what our circumstance. Thank you for being out there in the world, being willing to teach your mind and your body to thrive. I promise you it's possible even if and when it feels out of reach. Those of you with a yoga practice will know this in the physical body form, that when we first start going to yoga, we watch some of those things that crazy limber yoga teacher does and we think this body will never do that and lo and behold if you just go to class again and again and again all of a sudden this body will do poses that you used to think were impossible our emotional healing and development is no different you can heal you are healing light and love i want to do some patreon shout outs We cannot do the show without you. We appreciate you so, so much. By the time this episode is released, we will have completed October's live stream Q&A on hope. November's topic is intuition. Part of what you get when you come on to Patreon is you get a shout out. You let us know how you'd like us to share your name. From the bottom of my heart, Thank you for helping us spread this show across the world. Thank you, Charlene. Thank you, Deb. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you, Allison and Scarlett. Chelsea, Lizette, Sonia, Michelle, Melody, Donna, Stephanie, Eliana, Annie, Joe, and Lindsay. Signing up on our Patreon is a vote to keep Emotional Badass commercial free. I know you don't want to hear it and we don't want to mess up the vibe of the show. That's why you hear most of your shows that you love get commercials because that's how they build revenue in podcasting. So to those of you that have the disposable income, thank you so much. We know you are pulled in 10 billion directions about where to put your money. Thank you so much. That $2 that y'all throw us, that $5 y'all throw us, that 10, that coffee or two, makes a huge difference. It's part of how powerful we are as a group. Do not underestimate how you are helping the world heal by helping yourself heal. When you do that, you give other people around you subconscious permission to explore, to seek. And doesn't mean everybody will, but people will in ways that you may not ever even know. What happens if you allow yourself to melt into that, to believe that, that you are healing for yourself and you are healing for others? And in this way, we are powerful on this planet. And remember, I'm an emotional badass. You are an emotional badass. And together we are where Moxie meets Mindful. Light and love. And I'll see you right here next time. Bye-bye.